Good day, this is Jim Pytel from Columbia Guards Community College. This is Digital Electronics 1. This lecture is entitled PLD Implementation Exercise. And this one we're actually going to take that Happy Cat Cat Food Factory VHDL program that we just wrote in our previous exercises for the entity and the architecture and actually implement it on one of those Fandancy development boards I was referring to earlier. The one that I'm going to be using for this example, it's a Nexus 2. Mine's a 1200. There are 500 versions, so make sure you pick the right ones. How I'm going to do this is I am actually going to do this using Xilinx's program. It's the ISC Webpack uh, Project Navigator. It's free download. The version I've got is 13.4, if I remember right. I've used version 12 and 14. They're, they're all kind of the same thing. Don't worry about which version you've got, because the stuff that we're going to be doing, it's more than capable of doing it. Try to get above version 12, at least, because all we're going to be doing is uh, the VHDL input. What is the Nexus 2 that I'm using? Don't worry about it. You don't have to have this model. But, like I said, that code should be portable once you start using a particular manufacturer software. Let's say you've got an Altera board, like a DE2 or something, with a Cyclone 2 on it. You've got to use Altera's Quartus 2 to download that same portable VHDL program to it. Okay, the one I'm using is the Nexus 2 1200. It's manufactured by Digilent in uh, Pullman, Washington. Actually, I think they're manufactured in Romania but the company is up in Pullman. What's it got on it? It's got a Spartan 3E made by Xilinx on it. Uh, must have been a fan of the movie 300 because there's a series of Spartans um, of different complexities. Super brief tour, got some slide switches, push buttons. You can see this a little bit better. Uh, seven segment display, bunch of LEDs which you can use as outputs. These are really cool, they're peripheral modules. You can expand the capabilities of it. Here's a big old expansion slot here. Your power button, your reset button. You'll actually get your hands on these things in labs, so no sense in drawing a bunch of circles everywhere. I would be encouraging you to potentially maybe even download the user manual, which I've hooked up on the uh, the Moodle website. That's what we're going to download it to. Uh, you're going to see me using the IC Project Navigator uh, webpack from Xilinx. Like I said, the free download. I will put instructions how to download it. Uh, on the Moodle website, uh, the lab computer should already have on it. And um, look at that delicious, delicious little baby seal. He is going to be the prime ingredient for the Happy Cat Cat Food Factory. So what I've done here is again is here is our library statement. I know we haven't really discussed this much, but a library statement that is the the dictionary and the language that I'm going to use is IEEE, a standard logic. Um, I could potentially, if I'm doing arithmetic operations, I might need arithmetic library, but I'm not, so I'm just going to use this. Um, my entity statement describes my ins and my outs externally. Finally, I've got my architecture statement, which defines the internal behavior of what it does with those inputs and outputs. And additionally, notice here I've used some internal signals in that architecture in the declaration section. It's the exact same thing that I've done previously. This is kind of my first time uh, doing a recording of an actual PLD implementation exercise, so bear with me here for a little bit. So I'm going to flip flop back and forth between different screen applications. So here is what I've written in WordPad. Like I said, you don't need the Fantasy software program, even if it is free, to write these things. You can write this thing in WordPad. You can write it in Notepad, uh, Notepad, whatever. You can write it in Word. That's the same thing that I just wrote there, because I can't just write it in my OneNote and just send it. I got to actually write it out. That's the library statement. Here's my entity statement. Notice that, see, I had happy cat and then happy there. Same thing with happy. So yeah, it's you're, you're, trust me, guys, you guys are going to get syntax errors left and right. Where was I? Okay, entity statement. Uh, I've got my ports. I've got my ins and my outputs defined. And then I'm ending it. I got my architecture. I got my declaration section right there, the internal logic signals. And I'm kind of compressing them into one line. Uh, I actually kind of prefer doing two. For some reason, I did it on one line. Finally, I've got my architectural description. Okay, so I wrote that in WordPad, like I said. Uh, notice how I've been using colors when I've described these things on the previous lectures. The reason why I have been using colors is because you can clearly see what is a reserved word, what is a data type, what is a variable. WordPad, you don't get those th bells and whistles. 
the deal is is there is a VHDL editor and even a VHD, VHDL module maker within some of these software utilities. The, the, excuse me, the Xilinx uh, IC Webpack has that thing. And what's cool is if you write the word entity, it recognizes that it is a reserved or key word and it types it in blue for you. And if you write happy cat, it says it looks through its little library and it doesn't highlight that in blue. It keeps it black. And if you write standard underbar logic, it recognizes, hey, he's talking about a data type. It highlights it in pink. It's it's pretty cool. It's more visual than writing this thing out in WordPad. But you can still write this things these things in WordPad. Say, for example, I give you uh, a hint of potentially what a lab might be. And I'm going to say uh, you might want to think about coming to lab prepared. You can write this thing in WordPad. You can write the thing in advance. Or you could download that software for free and write the thing out and it will do all the fancy uh, formatting. What I have not talked about is these things right here. What is this? Okay, so it's that double hyphen hyphen. That's a comment. Anything within those is ignored. And what I'm telling myself, hey, future Jim Pytel, here is the dude that created it. His name was Jim Pytel. He created it on the 7th of August of 2013. What it's called, it had the cat behavioral, what the target device was, the Nexus 2 1200, and what a description was. It was an example multi level logic circuit for Digital Electronics 1. If I come back in the future and figure out, okay, what was this program I wrote this for, the description's right there. This is something I kind of include, uh, and this is actually uh, some of the VHDL modules from Xilinx do these things. They actually have these things that are commented out already, and it says to you, uncomment the following library declaration. If you want to use arithmetic functions, what you do is you say, delete, delete, if you want to use that. Having that extra library in there doesn't mean your design's not going to work. Uh, what I'm saying is it may, don't carry every book in the library with you. That is an example of comments. Okay, so that is WordPad. So now you could, in theory, write this thing up in WordPad and then use the software specific to that manufacturer to go ahead and implement the device in the PLD. But uh, since I want to show you guys the utility, specifically for this case, Xilinx, how they create a VHDL code, we'll actually use some of theirs. And let's go ahead and flip over to that application. This is what we're going to do. We're going to take what we kind of already have conceptualized for this program, and we're actually going to use the Xilinx ISE Project Navigator webpack to go ahead and implement this thing. What I'm going to do is look for it under the design tools. If you can't find it on your menu, the hamsters are going to run on their wheels. It's going to open up. And chances are what it's going to do is going to open up something that I've previously worked on. So what we're going to do is, and you got your tips there, uh, what I'm going to do is do a new project. And hamsters are going to turn the wheels. What is it going to be called? I'm going to call it happy underbar cat. Where's the location? I've got it set up so it always goes to my desktop, the FP FPGA projects. What it does, it creates a working directory under which all the files associated with this project are placed. What's my top level source? HDL. Basically, uh, I could do a schematic if I want to, you know, dragging and dropping, that's kindergarten stuff, we're not going to do that. Next. What is the device that I'm downloading to? This is, again, it's got to be, now you've got to be kind of a manufacturer and within that manufacturer you've got to be specific to it. What am I going to do is, I'm not using any of their evaluation boards, but I am using a Spartan 3E which Digilent happens to manufacture on the Nexus 2. This right here, which version is it? Which device is it? It's the 500 or the 1200. You know, look in that super, super, super tiny letters. I happen to use 1200 last, so I picked the 1200. You might be using a 500. Uh, you might be using something else. It's 320 ball grid array, uh, speed negative five. What am I gonna use as my synthesis tool? The Xilinx synthesis tool. There's a simulator called iSim. Uh, which we'll go into a little bit later here when we simulate this design before we actually program it because we want to make sure it works. My preferred language is VHDL. You could use Verilog, but we're not going to. That's it for that. Finish it. What do I want to do with this? What I want to do is I want to add a source to it. What I want to do is this thing called VHDL module. 
and this is pretty cool. It, you've already known the entity and the architecture. They have the same format every single time. It's got that architecture, begin, end, entity, blah, 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 is uh, all the way through. Why not just have this utility that does it for you? It makes you that skeleton. Okay, so let's go ahead and find where that guy is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to this window right here. I'm going to say new source. I can do an IP which is an intellectual property core generator. That's like things that are previously made. I can do a schematic. I can do a v Verilog module. There it is, VHDL module. And I'm gonna call it, just to stay consistent, happy underbar cat. Next. Look at this. It's like a wizard. It is telling you what, uh, what are your inputs there. So what are the inputs? I'm gonna say seals. That's an input. Don't worry about the bus, MSB, LSB. We'll get into that when we get into vectors. Husks, mats. What's my out output? Cat food. It is an output. I'm, it's kind of giving me a, a wizard for my entity. Okay, it's telling. I'm telling it. Here's my seals, husks, mats. That's my input. Here's my cat food output. Next. Finish it. And there you go. Well, there you go. It's got kind of that same comment section that I can fill out. Look at this, it's got the library already written for me. Here's got some more comments if I want to use arithmetic functions. And look at this, it's written my entity statement for me, just like we would have entity happy cat is port here's my inputs and it looks at look at how it does that in the three lines just like I like it so you can see your three inputs and there's your output finally there's end entity happy cat where's my architecture it's already written my architecture bare bones for me begin and all I got to do is fill out my declarations and fill out the beginning to the end kind of the logical description of that but let's go ahead and fill out our comments here and all I really did was kind of delete all the stuff that I don't need. And I've told who created it, what time he created it, what it is. And I can even say example for digital one. Got my library statement. I'm not doing any arithmetic operations because it said previously in those comments, this is uncomment. If you want to use it, well, I'm not using it. So I might as well just get rid of it. Entity statement, just like it was. Architecture. What we'll do is we'll go ahead and just write our architecture. Now, what I want to do is I want to, I'm going to write it for you and see if you can spot the mistake. Okay, there it is. Begin. Cat food is a sign, seals and husks, or seals and mass. Okay, what's the mistake I made? It's the parentheses, because this is going to give you a syntax error. Let's go ahead and put those, actually here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put the parentheses in, then I'm going to make another mistake somewhere else in there, see if you can find it. Okay, there you go. So I put those parentheses in there, but there's another mistake in there, and it's real subtle. The mistake I made here is the very end. I was missing the semicolon. Okay, so something as simple as a semicolon will make it fall apart, man. It's like that one bolt that's holding it all together that's going to say, ex the syntax is going to say expecting semicolon on line 21. There's there's a hundred ways to wreck these things. Okay, uh, one quick thing about these uh, VHDL modules and writing a VHDL programs within a company-specific software is notice the, the formatting. Notice that. All those blue words, all those pink words, all those green comments, all those black um, names that you can give them. Uh, look at the operators and look at this too. When I, on that parentheses, see how it turns red? It's telling me seals and husks are in parentheses. Seals and mats are within that parentheses. That, that's really cool. It shows you what you are putting together here. Okay, so we were just about to program this thing. Well, not program it. We are kind of end with the entry of the design phase. Because remember the a previous discussion we had about design entry. Well, first off, step zero, figure out what it's supposed to do, come up with the solution. Now we're going to go ahead and do the design entry. We just kind of did that. We're going to kind of do the synthesize. Okay. What we've got is kind of this little menu in this little window here. Be aware too that there's tabs for these things. This is, this will kill you because yeah, where is it? Where am I? I'm looking for it. It's behind. Uh, look even how their menus are set up. Design, synthesize, implement, program. It's just like that one description I gave you. Design, synthesize, implement, slash, place and route, generate programming file. One would think, yeah, I'm going to generate the programming file right now. Don't do it. Don't do it because you need to do the synthesize first. What are the tools within synthesize? I can check the syntax. I'm purposely going to get rid of those parentheses. There will be a syntax error. So what I'm going to do is rerun this because I've run it previously when y'all weren't looking. I'm going to rerun it. And what it's going to do is tell me, hey, changes have been made. Yes, I do want to change it because I want to save that version without the parentheses. See what happens here? Okay, it's going to run and run and run and run. Look at the wheel, it's moving. It's checking syntax, checking it. Oh, 
here we go, error on such and such VHDL module, line 21. And look at where I'm in here, this window. Because if you got console up, that's console is kind of the, the list of things that have happened. Errors, that's the one I want. Warnings, find a file results. It, when it comes up with that red X, where are the errors? Well, they're right there in the red X. You gotta have that window open. Where is it? It's in line 21. It's a parse error, unexpected or expecting semicolon. And what you gotta do is just go to line 21. What's going on? unexpected or. So it's what it's saying is, is, hey, there's something going on here. You may have messed it up. It says expecting semicolon. You might be like, well, hey, I've got that semicolon. That's not the error. Well, it's it's really, it's kind of complaining about the or. It's giving you its best rendition of what the error may be. What do you mean? Do you mean seals and husks? Notice how the parentheses. Or seals and mats. Or do you mean some other rendition? It's asking you for clarification. Now I can go ahead and check syntax again. What I would do is click on there, rerun, but I'm actually going to introduce another error. You will have these. You will have these. I got rid of that semicolon at the end. Now what is that error going to say? Got the parentheses. I removed a semicolon. So let's see what this error might say. Do you want to save the changes you made? Yes. Checking syntax. Hamster is running in the wheel. Oh, here we go. Line 23. Parse error. Wait a second. Wasn't my error on line 21? What it's saying is it doesn't know that the error occurred until line 23 because it says unexpected end. You can't have an end statement if it's not preceded by a semicolon. And where do you find that? It says expecting semicolon. When you see an error, and again we are in this window, not in warnings, not in console, we're in errors. But when it says line 23, that is kind of like an artillery shell being lobbed in the general direction of the bad guy. Look in that impact crater, you know, somewhere around line 23, there should be a semicolon and it's up there. There you go. So now I have got a pretty functional rerun it. Yes, I want to change it. So this should be good. I got my parentheses and my semicolons. Checking syntax, do, 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 do. Green, looking good. We're looking good. Our VHDL is looking fine. So let's see if we can move on to the next step. Okay, so now that our synthesized, we've checked the syntax, everything's looking good here. Let's go ahead, uh, what's the next step? So it's design entry, synthesis, implement, program it. We're actually gonna kind of do implement, design, and generate programming file together. But uh, one thing I wanted to, to show you here real quick, these hierarchy windows, they affect the display of this one down here. So for example, if I click on the project, notice how that window changes. Now back to that VHDL project. So if you're not seeing what you're looking for here, chances are you need to be clicking on the, the correct one. So what I actually want to do is I want to do a uh, simulation next. Okay, so notice here I can go in and potentially do a run of the implemented design, excuse me, implement, uh, do the place and route, I can do the run. Let's not do that. I want to do behavioral simulation here. So how I do that is this button. And these two little buttons there, the two tiniest buttons, that is going to be the source of the biggest confusion for you guys too, is finding, because the, the views change between implementation and simulation. So here I'm up on the project, I want to simulate it and you don't see the simulator because the deal is you got to be selecting the VHDL module you just created. You can't just select the project, you got to be on the VHDL module. It says simulate behavioral model. I'm going to go ahead and right click run. So what that's going to do is going to open up the iSim light simulator which is freely available with the IC webpack version. What it does it shows me kind of this little logic analyzer screen and I've got my inputs and my output and it's unknown because I have no known inputs being placed in so I've got unknown output and what I'm gonna do and there are extremely complicated ways to do this all we're doing is just the behavioral uh, check right now just to see does this thing work uh, we're not doing timing constraints we're not basically I'm not doing a functional timing analysis right now We'll go into these things as we get more uh, advanced, potentially writing test test benches. We're just doing a very simple ISM simulator. What I want to do is force an input. So I'm going to click on seals. That's one of my inputs. Right click it. I'm going to say force a clock. That signal name is seals. I'm going to say it's leading edge is zero, trailing edge is one. I don't give it any offset. I got three signals. So I'm going to give it 
eight microseconds and that period is two microseconds. Do you see what see what I'm doing here? Every two microseconds it goes from that zero to one, it flip-flops. And now what am I gonna do with husks? I'm gonna do every four microseconds. What am I gonna do with mats? Every eight microseconds. Ultimately what I'm gonna do is within that eight microsecond time period that I've set up, it will go through all possible combinations of three inputs. So I'm gonna apply. I can press OK and just walk out of it and do it again. Force clock, zero, one, eight, US by the way, that's microseconds, four microseconds, and I can apply that one. The other thing is I don't have to OK it and come back out. And also to notice what's what's telling me in the console. It's telling me I forced it here. It's kind of a strip recorder of what you're doing in case you mess something up. I can apply that thing. I just applied it again. I don't have to go back out. I can just say mats, period. Keep everything else the same, eight microsecond. Apply. So now what I want to do is I want to go ahead and do 16 microseconds. And this right here, that little button next to it, run for the specified time on the toolbar. Just like any of those other programs out there, if you, uh, you want to know what a button does, you just hover over it. Okay, I can zoom in, and zoom out, uh, redraw, etc., etc. So let's say I run for the time specified on the toolbar and get green lines. There's known values now. What I'm going to do is zoom to full view. So it was unknown, and then at right there, it turns on 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. So seals is taking kind of that LSB implement. So now it's every two, 0, 0, 1, one, zero, zero, one, one. Finally, four zeros, four ones. What's our output? And that's kind of the key. Is this thing doing what we'd expect? Is this device that we're simulating, is it even gonna work? I mean, think about this. There are no seals, there are no corn husks, there are no mats being put into our giant vat processor. Are we gonna get cat food out? No. Seals are being put into it, but there's no filler agents, there's no husks, there's no mats. Nope. Now it's just husks. No seals. No mats. Nope. Ah, here we go. Corn husks and seals are being ground together and you get cat food out. What's this thing here? Just mats. Nope. Nope. No cat food. Finally, what you get here is mats and seals. Yes. And now you get everything all being grounded together. And I skipped over that one because that's just husks. Ah, excuse me. Mats and husks. Just filler agents. Finally, you get this here. This is your truth table. It's your truth table in timing diagram format. Does it work? Does it does it do what you expect it to? And the key thing is is you gotta know. You have to know up front what your truth table is gonna look like. Because this is meaningless garbage to you if you don't know how your particular logic circuit was supposed to work at the beginning. The iSIM simulator of the behavioral simulations doing what we'd expect. Okay, so now that we've done our design entry and our synthesis, we've checked our syntax and we went ahead and done our simulation. Now we want to actually go ahead and tie it to a particular device. So the example that we're using here, I'm going to use a Nexus 2 1200. I've got these slide switches down here and I've got these LEDs right there. Those are the inputs and outputs that I'm going to use. And this is for development purposes we're just going to see if our circuit works and this is kind of neat these development boards are already wired for you you don't have to spend those time soldering and connecting these things and you can always in a real implementation in case you ever wanted to make cat food out of seals you get a you've got this FPGA that's taking these inputs potentially from the context of a motor control thing and the output is a, a relay uh, for some control relay. But right now what we're going to do is we're going to simulate using the slide switches inputs and the LEDs for an output. This now deals with is what's called a UCF, user constraint file. And you're very specific to the boards for the UCFs. For example, Nexus 2 has different pinouts for the 500 version and the 1200 version. Which ones are tied to the LEDs? Which ones are tied to the slide switches? That's where you need the UCF file for the board you are using. I've placed the, the UCF files for the boards that we're using on the Moodle page. You can always download these from Digilent or whatever your particular manufacturer is. So how do I do that within the IC Project Manager? I've obviously got this Happy Cat project opened. And this is what I'm telling you guys is you're gonna get lost in here and I guarantee this is the spot you're gonna get lost. We just did a simulation. We used iSIM, which is a different program. We closed it out and now we're back in the Project Navigator. Where are we? We're still in simulation mode. You need to be in implementation. 
and if you don't see the menu look at what's going on here press implementation all those now I can implement it and generate the programming file I don't see that in simulation okay I don't see that I've got iSim simulator and I can simulate the behavior of model like we just did but notice these radio buttons here change the views if you're lost guarantee between those two buttons next place you're gonna get lost these little file menus these give me these little tabs next place you're gonna get lost is these tabs here and next thing you're gonna get lost is these tabs right here what do I want to do I want to create a UCF file how I do that is let's just do it this way file I don't want a new project I don't want any of those things I'm just gonna say new new text file the UCF file is very similar to VHDL in the fact that it's got its own specific syntax and its own specific comments. For example, a comment in the UCF file is actually the number sign. And I'm going to say inputs. I'm going to list my three inputs. And then I'm going to give myself some space here. What do you think this is? Outputs. What I have to do is, is kind of this same specific, very rigorous way of doing it. I'm going to say net quotation, quotation, with a space in between. I'll show you what this means. L-O-C equals quotation, space, space, space. There's something that's going to be in those spaces, semicolon. And what I can even do is comment that. And I'm going to say seals input slide switch zero. So that's commented. This is active that first blank thing is that's your name seals the location what pin do I want it to go to I want it to go to slide switch 0 which is in my version G18 let's do seals husks mats so let's do husks switch 1 it's at pin H18 so let's see if you can do husks ideally you've written the following NET quotation HUSKS quotation LOC equals quotation h18 quotation semicolon now I could comment I can say husks input I'm just gonna say sw1 finally what is our last input mats loc equals in my particular uh, I'm gonna use switch two. you don't need to memorize these don't do that you get far more important things to remember like showing up to class on time there's my inputs now I'm gonna move on to my outputs and what is my output it is cat food and we're going to do a seven segment display or not seven segment display uh, led zero and that's going to go ahead and light up if we've either got seals and husks or seals and mats or seals and husks and mats ideally again you got to know how the thing works originally how it was originally designed equals what is led zero on mine let me go ahead and look at my ucf same one as the 500 because difference between the 500 and 1200 like i said is the pinouts on the thing obviously 1200 is bigger the other thing is this too is the 1200 is mislabeled so if you ever grab a 1200 led four through seven are actually mislabeled on it don't worry so much about that right now unless you have a 1200 and when i say i said look at my ucf file what are, we're going to be using a lot of those leds we're going to be using a lot of those slide switches and those push buttons and those seven segment displays because that's the the greatest it's the easiest outputs for us for our course um so it honestly just helps to have just a list of those and you can comment them out you know save these things say for example i only have two inputs for this design i'm going to comment that out save this thing and then when you have something with three inputs you just uncomment that thing and then i'm going to go ahead and put a comment here i'm going to say cat food out put led zero and I'm making so everything looks the same okay so what I want to do with this thing I want to save it where do I want to save it I want to save it in happy cat what is that the type UCF that's what's gonna give you an error is you save as file type because the first one for some reason it's Verilog I don't know why but you got to go through this menu VHDL UCF so you can always write to VHDL programs without that little fancy editor I showed you earlier you can always write UCFs any of these different types of files here but I'm gonna save it as UCF and then I'm gonna say happy cat UCF save so now that I've saved it I'm gonna actually have to add that source so that's the other thing is is I saved the thing and notice too is once I saved it here it's got my green as my comments it's showing me that location and net are words it recognizes okay so now I've got to actually go ahead and associate that source that UCF file with our particular project we're working on okay so now I'm gonna go ahead and add a source what am I gonna do uh, geez this is the the problems of saving everything is the same 
name because I can't tell. Let me go back to without the details list. I can't tell which one's the UCF file. I can't tell which one's the VHDL. So I'm going to go to details. That's the one. I want the UCF. There you go. And then adding a file to the project, 101 files. I think we're ready to go here. So we've got our VHDL in there. We've got our UCF in there. Let's close up the synthesis. I could do uh, implement and then generate programming file, but actually what I'm going to do is just generate a programming file. It's going to go ahead and run, and if all goes well, we should get check marks for the programming file generation report. Be aware if any error is going to show up, they're going to show up here in errors. I'm probably getting a warning because I think the um, subscription to this uh, version 13.4, I think I'm out of date, so I'll probably get a one warning. We'll see if that's true. Okay, so it gave us a green check on the synthesis. Let's go out and see if it's doing the implement design here. Um, by the way, too, you will get uh, syntax errors for a UCF file, too. It'll tell you, okay, line 7. You, oh, by the way, you have to have that equal sign in there. L uh, ask me how I know, because I didn't. I had a problem. I left one out, and it gave me a syntax error. The other thing is, is too, is vector notation, which we'll go into a little bit later. It's a slightly different for a UCF file using vectors. So I'm actually going to go ahead and pause and uh, let this thing run. Okay, several hours have elapsed since we last spoke. Actually, just kidding, just like two minutes. So what we've done, we've done here, we've got the synthesize, we've got a green check mark, implement. What is that? Looks like a little caution sign. Where would I find potentially that? Right here at the caution signs, warnings. Your software subscription, yeah, ignore it. Generate programming file, we got the green. What are we going to do with this now? Okay, so now is what we're going to do is we're actually going to program our device. The Digilent boards, the Nexus board, uses a software program from Digilent called Adept to actually download it to there. Okay, so we've got our programming file and everything's looking good. Let's go ahead and use the Digilent Adept to download this to our particular device. Uh, so what I've done is I've actually hooked the device to the little USB connector right there and I've since hooked that USB to my computer. I've turned on the power and I see a little light right about there that says power. I know it's running. There are configuration files stored on here and I can reload and it does a kind of a check for me and I could see pass 128 on there. Uh, mine I had something else on it earlier so that thing's been wiped out. So what I'm going to do is download that onto here. So how do, how do I do that? Is using the Adept software. Start this up. What I want to do, it says it's recognizing that I've connected to a Nexus 2. It's loading the board information. Do I want to program the FPGA or do I want to program the memory device on there? Because like I said, the FPGAs are volatile. If you reset it, you're going to have to reload it. But in this particular device, and I recommend this, don't, don't do this. If we're in, when we're in lab, don't permanently load it to the memory. Okay, just use this one. What do I want to load? I'm going to browse to Happy Cat. What am I looking for? I'm looking for a bit file. That is, by the way, that's the projects that I've been working on right there. This is the one I was working on, happycat.bit. Open it, ignore the error about clocking, program it. Ignore the error about clocking, look at it, programming, and you will see right there, that LED right there will light up. I don't know if you can see my mouse. If you've done everything correctly, that LED right there lights up, indicating that it's done. So I'm actually going to cut now to a view of the board once it's programmed. We're going to do our little slide switch just to test if it works. Does that LED zero light up when we have the desired inputs on it? Before I do that, uh, let's pause for a moment and just think about potentially what, may, what we might be doing in lab this particular unit. Okay, like I said, I'm not going to quiz you guys on the schemat, excuse me, the syntax, the exact syntax of these entity and architecture, architecture statements right now because I need you to do this in lab and actually write some of these things. You should know the difference between a library, the purpose of an entity and architecture, the differences and purposes. But think about this. We've, we've covered a lot of material in Unit 3. We've covered a NOT gate, an AND gate, an OR gate. We've covered a NAND gate, a NOR gate, and their negative logic equivalents negative and, negative or, got our exclusive or, exclusive nor. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. We could discuss here, what about making a VHDL program, which ties every single inputs to A and B, and making nine outputs. Uh, we actually got to limit ourselves to eight. This one's easy, so let's get rid of that one. Uh, make eight outputs, because we've got LEDs zero to seven. How would a circuit like that, how would we define? What I'm saying is, is this is our new logic gate. Let's call it mishmash. 
how would the entity look for a mishmash with two inputs and eight outputs? What is the architecture description of mishmash? Let me go ahead and redraw what a mishmash circuit might look like. And there is a better representation of what I'm asking is if our inputs A and B are applied to every single one of those gates, what might the expressions for S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z look like in the architecture statement? How would I define these inputs being slide switch 0, slide switch 1, and all these being LED 0 to 7 in the UCF file? So start thinking about these things. These are things that we can do in lab. We're not limited to just two input gates, too. We could potentially have super mishmash with three input AND gates all the way down. So these are things that start thinking about them now. If you want to potentially tackle mishmash at least for the two input gates, go ahead and try it. And you're going to come into the lab that much more prepared, having a good idea what the entity statement will look like and what the architecture statement will look like. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, we're actually going to cut to a video of the board with the Happy Cat circuit implemented on it where switch 0, 1, and 2 are inputs and LED 0 is our output. Okay, this is the moment that you have been waiting for. We're actually going to go ahead and download our particular bit file to our development board. The development board I'm using is a Nexus 2 1200 manufactured by Digilent Corporation. It's got a Xilinx Spartan 3E FPGA centrally located and a bunch of really cool inputs and outputs that are already pre-wired for you. So notice I got a power LED right over here and I've got a done LED right here. So what I've already downloaded the program but I'm going to show you guys what it looks like when you get the thing. I'm going to press this reset button in the upper left hand corner and notice the done light went away. So now I've got to go ahead and reload that. So make sure you've got that done light. Make sure you actually have a program on it. I'm going to press program again. That's that happycat.bit file we were using previously. Ignore the warning about the clock and then done comes back on okay so I've got the program reloaded uh, make sure you got your power light on there make sure things powered on um, ask me how I know because it doesn't work all right so what I've done is define these bottom three these excuse me these right three most slide switches as our inputs seals corn husks and mats and I've defined this single LED our rightmost LED LED zero as our output for cat food what we're trying to do is going to go ahead and see if this thing works this is our in-circuit test of our device. We've done the behavioral simulation using some of the Xilinx IC Project Navigator abilities, but now we want to go ahead and see, okay, does this thing really work? And first and foremost, before you do this thing, how does it work? You should have already developed a truth table using some of the techniques I've taught you about the multi-level logic circuit analysis. But ultimately, what you're going to see is this will only signify that it is an acceptable form of cat food if there is one protein source, i.e. seals, and any one of two filler agents, husks or mats. Okay? So let's go ahead and just walk through all possible combinations. I've got already got three zeros there. Okay, so let's try zero, zero, one. Okay, just seals. Is that an acceptable form of cat food? Nope. What about zero one zero? Okay, just horn corn husks. Is that a Acceptable form? No. What about 0, 1, 1? It is. Okay, you've got seals and corn husks, and you've got an acceptable form of cat food. Go up to the next one. 1, 0, 0. Nope. 1, 0, 1. Yes, you do. Okay, so what that represents is ground up gym mats and seals. 1, 1, 0. Two filler agents, mats and husks. Nope. The cat does not have the necessary protein to survive. But then you go along and do one, one, one. You got one happy cat because you've got seals and corn husks and ground up gym mats. This concludes this portion of the exercise PLD implementation.